Today is a, a beginning of our Psalms series. We're going to spend four weeks with various speakers looking at the Psalms. And our Sabbath school lesson this quarter has been also looking at the Psalms. And the theme really for today is Thanksgiving. And my sermon is titled Grateful Hearts. And as we reflect on the Psalms and as we partake in the human story connected with God, we're going to unpack what it looks like to be living in the in-between. Because we are living in the in-between. We're looking forwards to experiencing what it's going to be like, to be like the sheep in the Father's paddocks for eternity. But we live in this in-between, and in fact, another word for it is liminal space. Has anyone ever heard this term before? Liminal space. A liminal space is the space that you, you, a blank space really, that you go through to get to another location. It's kind of just something that's a bit empty. It's not like a paddock, it's more like a white, stark hallway. Does that hallway seem like the most inviting place to you? No? But do you have to utilise that hallway to get somewhere? Yeah, right? Airports. Airports are a great example of a liminal space. There's no real utility to airports except from getting from one place to another. Unless you're a Qantas business lounge person, then they're great, right? I've never been ac- accessed a lounge, so if you have a ticket. But a liminal space. The space in, in, between, in, in the in-between. And that's where we find ourselves today. We are in the liminal space between the cross and heaven. We are in the space between what has happened and what will happen. Throughout the Psalms, there's this whole heap of focuses that we find, and if if we had a few hours, you could really unpack the, the way the Psalms are structured with their five books and what each of them focus on. But each Psalm really has a focus on either theology or anthropology. In other words, it has a focus on God or it has a focus on our human story. Because an anthropologist, what they really do is they look at human stories and our humanity and unpack who we are and what we're about. And that's really what many of the Psalms are focusing on. And the Psalmists, as I use the plural there, I put the little apostrophe in, consider who God is and what our relationship with Him is like. In other words, that's a, a way to describe that is to use the word ontology, which we'll unpack in just a moment. But we're going to look at Psalms 116 today, if your Bible's there. We're going to look at Psalms 116. And in Psalm 116, it shifts gears. In the Psalms prior, there was a real focus on theology, unpacking the, the who, the what, the why of God. In Psalms 116, it shifts gears and looks at the anthropology or the ontology of our response to who God is. Psalms 116 explores the psalmist and our response to God's salvation. As we partake of emblems today, that's what we're doing. We are responding to the salvation that God has offered you. So Psalm, I'll give you some, some structure before we get into it. Psalms 116 is in two parallel halves. Why is it parallel? Because they mirror each other in their structure. Uh, in, in, in verses 1 through to 9, we see talking about the affliction and how bad things are and then how God has followed through. And then in the verses 10 through to 19, again, we see a focus on the affliction, how bad things are and how God has delivered them. That's what we see. So this question I want to ask is how can we participate in the human story with God? How are we today participating in the human story with God? Throughout history, this is something that humans have grappled with and we've attempted time and time again to make God's story into our story. God, in fact, actually wants to make your story his story. We don't need to make God's story our story. God already does that. He wants to engage with us and make whatever mess we have testify of him. Psalms 116 goes like this. Let's let's read it all through and then we'll unpack it afterwards. I love the Lord. 
because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you, for you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Part one. And then part two. I kept my faith, even when I said I am greatly afflicted. I said in my consternation, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord of all his bounty to me. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant. The child of your servant girl, you have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Part one of this this psalm is really all about our relationship with God. Trying to work out where we sit in His reality. This is ontology, which is our understanding of who God is. Where did you get your understanding of who God is? Anyone want to answer? Where did you work out who God is? Anyone have any answers? Because for most people, the Bible, yeah. For most people, it's actually their parents. Is where they got their image of who God is. When I'm doing some chaplaincy work and I sit down one-on-one with kids and I unpack where their image of God has come from, but often their angry image of God, guess where it comes from? An angry dad. Or an angry mum. That is where our first understanding of who God is comes from. Which is why when when I'm working with kids who come from households that are very authoritarian, guess how they view God? As an authoritarian God. Or when I work with kids from households where their parents simply don't care about them and neglect them, guess what kind of God they see? They see a neglectful, uncaring God. Now, we all know that, and we, we know that kids eventually create their own understanding of God as they become teenagers. But all too often that is shaped by their first understanding of who God is. Your view of God today, no matter how old you are, is likely likely in some way influenced by the way your parents were. And so as this psalmist is writing this psalm, he's trying to see this image of God being this loving, caring, gentle being. And he, he uses a word in there, in there which is petty or simple. And it says, God relates to the simple. What does it mean to be simple? Today we might, we might say to be simple is a bit of a derogatory term, right? But this word means simple, lacks wisdom, in need of help, inexperienced. In other words, God wants to protect us and care for us and uplift us. When we're in need of wisdom, when we're inexperienced, when we are a little bit lost, God lifts you up. You might be feeling like you're a a bit of a a petty today, that, that you are feeling a bit simple, a bit broken, a bit far away, a bit stuck in the mess. The psalmist in, 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 chap, in, in, in the first part is saying that God lifts you up. God lifts up and protects the simple. He rescues you. And as a result of, of being rescued, the psalmist says we find rest and salvation in the land of the living. 
The land of the living is a bit like those sheep in the paddock, right? Being protected from the wolves, from those that wish to ensnare them. Because God, I want to tell you this morning, God rescues you. God has rescued me, even when I was living like the ones that need wisdom. Like the ones that need to grow. As we partake in communion, as we partake in this, in this, in this thanksgiving service, as we drink the wine and we, and we enjoy the bread, we are partaking in God's story, in a proclamation that he lifts up the petty, he lifts up the simple, he lifts up those that are in a mess. Verses 10 to 19 are parallel to the first half. We're not going to spend too long there because the point has already been made. But the first half of this psalm was all about the experience of thanksgiving, or an expression of thanksgiving, talking about it. Now, is it all good to talk a big game, right? But if we don't have action that follows through, it's kind of pointless. So this psalmist is talking about this thanksgiving that he has for God, and then he gets to the second half and he desires, it says in verses 18 and 19, to, to take part in a sacrifice. Now, why does he want to take part in a sacrifice? Because he wants to experience salvation. In the psalmist's mind, it was looking forward to the opportunity when he would get to partake in the sacrifice again so that he might be made right with God. Verse 12 and 13 talks about the cup of salvation. All this imagery is there because there's a ritual that takes place where an experience of salvation occurs. Today, as we partake, we are partaking of emblems that represent the salvation that you already have. As we, as we dig into this psalm, we see affliction that results in a need for refuge to be found in God. As you go about your week, as things go wrong, as you're afflicted, Where do you find refuge? Whose paddock are you eating the grass within? Psalm 116.10 is this really beautiful thing because, as, as I'll read it out to you again, this is what it says. It says, I kept my faith even when I said, I am greatly afflicted. I am greatly afflicted. As you drink and you eat today, even though you might be greatly afflicted, you can proclaim that you have kept your faith. In Romans 4.3 and in in, uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4.13, sorry, Paul quotes this verse from Psalms chapter 116 and verse 10, and Paul is seeing this psalm as a reminder that God is faithful and true no matter the affliction that we might find ourselves in. Paul was in prison. He was chained up. Yet he said, I'll hold my faith, no matter the affliction that comes my way. In Psalms 116, the psalmist is looking forward to when they will partake of the cup of salvation. What we're doing today is just a shadow. It's just a poor reflection of what God's salvation is on the cross. But as we pick up the cup, I want you to do so in the knowledge that whether you're below my knees in height and age or whether you have outlived me by many decades so far, you have equal access to the cup of salvation. Today we're going to practice a shadow of what was the sacrificial system, a shadow of what Jesus did on the cross. As we do so today, let's do it with thanksgiving. Because today is an opportunity to accept God's cup of salvation with thanksgiving. 
So why do we even do this communion service? We do it because God said so, that it will happen until he returns. We do it because it's a reflection of what happened in, in, in the Passover. But we also do so because it's an opportunity for us to recommit ourselves. It's also an opportunity to accept what God has done for us. And as we're, we're about to head into the foot washing element, and I want to tell you that you can partake of whatever elements today you feel like you'd like to. We practice as a church open communion. The word open there is important, right? Anyone that is here today can partake of any elements that they would like to do so. God has invited you to partake, to experience this process. In just a moment, we're, we're going to go out and we're going to wash each other's feet as a symbol of the humility that Christ had in, in washing his disciples' feet, but also in, as a recommitment to one another that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, doing church family, doing salvation, doing love and life together. When we go out there, there will be a large circle. If you're a family or a couple, feel free to enjoy that. There's two smaller spaces on one on either side. Uh, the ladies over towards the left today and the gentlemen over towards the right today. And as you go out there and partake, I want you to do so with one another in a way in which you are able to share and pray for each other afterwards. So wash each other's feet, pray with each other, and then make your way back in here. As Jesus moved towards the cross, he instructed one of the disciples. He sent Peter and John, saying to them, Go and prepare the Passover meal for us, that we may eat it. They asked him, where do you want us to make preparations for it? Listen, he said to them, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you, follow him into the house he enters, and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where is the guest room, where may I eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, already furnished, make preparations for us there. So they went and they found everything as they had told them and they prepared the Passover meal. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. I am looking forward to the day where we see this fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Of God. We're about to partake in this ceremony in a moment. The deacons will come forward and are going to hand out the bread, they're going to hand out the grape juice. Symbols of Jesus' body and Jesus' blood that he gave for you and for me. Let's bow our heads. Loving Father in heaven, I thank you for this bread and this grape juice that we are about to partake of. I thank you for those that have prepared it. I thank you for our team that is handing it out. But most of all, Lord, I thank you for what you have done for us on the cross. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's distribute.
as we are about to partake of the bread, I'd like to ask Merlene to pray over, over the bread before we eat it. Our Father in heaven, we thank, we thank you, Jesus, who was the grain that fell to the earth and produced a thousandfold. We want to give you our hearts and that the word of life will grow in our hearts. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night when he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do so in remembrance of me. You may eat. Before we partake of the grape juice, I'd like to ask Kevin, one of our elders, to pray over the juice. Eternal. Eternal God, we come before you and acknowledge <clears throat> the sacrifice lovingly and freely made for our redemption. We pray we will always be willing to take on the name of your Son and to keep the commandments he gave us. We take this wine in remembrance of Christ's blood, shed for us, and we ask your blessing on it in Jesus' name. Amen. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You may drink. As our music team is coming up to play our final song, I chose the goodness of God. Why? Well, because as the psalmist declared, as we unpack today, that we can give thanksgiving, we can take the cup of salvation, we can rest in His goodness. As we sing this song, I want you to reflect on the words, to reflect on the thanksgiving for what God has done for us throughout this wonderful song. Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples, for great is his steadfast love toward us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Lord, as we head through this week, as we reflect on what we're partaking through today, I pray that we may be able to call on you when we need wisdom, but most of all that we may be able to accept the cup of salvation that you poured out for us on Calvary. Wonderful name we pray. Amen.